This episode is part of Lanfrica Talks. Lanfrica Talks provides a platform to showcase efforts in language technologies around the world. To learn more or attend our live sessions, see the description below. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another Lanfrica Talks session. Today, we are very honored to have Mr. Chester Wewu, a machine learning researcher. And he will talk to us about his award-winning research work on machine translation for African sign languages. This research got the best paper award at the Africa NLP workshop hosted at the ICLR 2023 International Conference. Chester Guewu is a young growing machine learning researcher with interest at the intersection of natural language processing and computer vision. Specifically, he is keen to explore how NLP and CV can fuse and learn from each other in a multimodal space. For the past year, his research has been focused on Washington generative adversarial networks and sign language translation systems. He is originally from Cameroon and graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana last March 2023. We're very honored to have you, Mr. Chester, and the stage is yours. Thanks, Chris, for um, hosting me to the show. So um, in this presentation, I'm going to speak about the uh, machine translation for African sign languages. Uh, by Shester Guil, yeah, for Latin Africa Talks. And today, this is a work that was done with uh, other co-authors and which was presented at um, the Africa NLP workshop at ICR 2023. So we're just going to get started, yeah. So, so, so what's my, what was my motivation working on um, sign languages, uh, this type of task and things? It's because um, I realized how sign languages serve as the dominant primary and most preferred means of communication by deaf individuals. Um, they feel comfortable speaking this language more than any other language. And, uh, I feel like the essence of technology is to help people feel comfortable in their daily lives. Another incident was me and my, uh, a meeting, Marco Nyako, which was a deaf lecturer in my university in Ghana, and uh, was also the co-author of, of, co of the paper. And his best friend died um, uh, because when he reached the hospital, uh, they wrongly diagnosed him. Uh, I mean, like they gave me wrong treatment because they misinterpreted what he was saying because he was deaf. So I was like, um, the essence of these technologies will really be impactful um, in this part of the world. And there are more than 300 plus sign languages all over the world. And I realized how uh, most of the research is only focusing on a few of them. And 80% of had of hearing people live in middle and low level income countries, according to a report made by a WHO. This is taken and, because, um, and very shocking because 80% of people live in low and middle level income countries. And at the same time, like this is the same place where you have like the least amount of research about sign language. So I was like, we need to take ownership about this research area. So all of this motivated me somehow to make the jump into sign language translation. So why is sign language translation, uh, why is sign language translation a challenging task at the end of the day? I was just um, looking at this tweet by Elizabeth Sampert uh, around January and it was funny, you know, we were in this, um, in this uh, area of where chat GPT came out, GPT-4 and everyone thought it was going to lose their job, but uh, AI couldn't still uh, even figure out sign languages. Uh, so she was like, people shouldn't worry, we are not all going to lose our job. So yeah, it's really challenging because even those models can't yet have a very good understanding of what sign languages are and how they really work. And to, to, to give now a contrast, maybe 
contrasting maybe sign languages compared to spoken languages. By spoken languages here, yeah, I mean like any language which is written or spoken. Um, yeah, written languages also count. So um, it's just like you learning, having piano, and on one side you have, you just press one key at a time on the piano. And on other tabs, like you have your 10 fingers and each of them have to be coordinated very well for you to make the good musical uh, um, thought you want to make. So in spoken language, it's just like pressing one key at a time. And in sign language, it's just like using all the parameters, like all the 10 fingers and things. So here we have things like, what are the parameters which count in sign languages? We have the hand shapes, you have the body movement, you have the facial expressions, and you have also the speed of the movement you do. Two movements at two different speed can mean two different things. So uh, to interpret a sign, you have to take all these parameters into consideration simultaneously. And that is what makes particularly sign language translation a challenging task compared, for example, to spoken languages. And to give another good example, I, uh, is this TED talk I really like. Uh, it's about, it's on American Sign Language, but you can see how the lady is producing eight different signs of eight different things or eight different words, but the differences between the signs are very minute, like they are very small. One small change in the, the way the hand is uh, posed or the way the where the hand is, the direction of the hand changes everything, the direction of the face, the direction of uh, uh, the body posture, the speed of the movements, all those are just to show two pointing fingers. All of them involve two pointing fingers, and but the pointy fingers in different directions mean different things. So a model really has to understand all of these, you know, like that if it points forward, if it points backward, if the face is doing like this, if um, the body posture is a different way, all of these needs to be taken into consideration when determining which sign the person is making and stuff like that. Yeah. And in and also we have a lot of false assumptions about sign languages and a lot of abusive language. Uh, a lot of tips have been made by many researchers and whether it's about publications which have really been accepted, but which uh, in reality were containing very offensive and false information inside, uh, mostly because people don't work in collaboration with deaf people. So they just assume things about them. And at the end of the day, you know, the papers get published, but when uh, the deaf community reads they feel uh, offended by what is written inside. We have had some incidents across it, and a lot of researchers too have encouraged people to stop making assumptions, uh, console the deaf community, talk to them about what you're having, and not just make assumptions. So I just highlighted for those assumptions made by uh, notable researchers. Yeah. And another thing too, yeah, it we always see uh, trends in how. Um, there are some gloves technology who are now translating sign languages and that's it, it's the end of the world. It's just a hype in reality because uh, on the few slides uh, before, we could see how um, there is actually, um, sign language is not just about the hands. So even if the gloves can only capture the hands movements, it's not just the hands, it's, it's about. And um, there was this workshop at ECCG at 2020, uh, where Professor Christian Vogler of Gaudet University, who is um, a deaf professor, was uh, speaking about how people should please make it stop, like uh, all these articles which come out and always gives the impression that the problem has been solved. Meanwhile, uh, the people who are really using the technology, they feel like it hasn't been solved because you are just in your room and you are just doing one sign with your gloves and you feel like it's there. that's it. But when you give it to the deaf people, you know, they use it and they feel like, I can't use this thing for anything. It doesn't really translate what I'm saying. So yeah, uh, just to make about this um, false assumptions. Another aspect too is that there has been very few NLP researchers involved in this research topic. Um, Kayoin uh, from, um, she's now a PhD student at uh, UC Berkeley. She published a paper in 2021, which was showing uh, the trend of 
the research in general computer science and on ACL anthology. And you can see how basically like, uh, there isn't even a year where you have up to 100 publications in total on ACL anthology, or, and usually there are very few. And on the right, you can see how on at the top two NLP conferences, ACL and EMNLP, uh, for the past three years, you can see how the numbers of publications accepted on sign languages have been very low, like zero in 2020, no one was speaking about it. In 2021, it increased a bit, and 2022 has increased again further, and we hope again it's going to increase again this year. And we can also say the increase has also been caused by Kayo's uh, paper, which won in 2021, which won a best team paper at ACL in about uh, why NLP researchers should include sign languages in their research. Because it's an integral language just like any other language. Yeah. And uh, just to also contrast this with spoken languages, we can see how the first WMT shared task on, on spoken languages started back in 2006. Uh, meanwhile, for sign languages, it started just last year in 2022. That's when we had the first uh, WMT shared task. And the good news is that uh, the second one is has just gotten started. So we really encourage people to participate. So what's sign language translation and how is this different from sign language recognition? Uh, terms used are very important in this uh, space. So I always like to compare like sign language recognition to like a one-to-one mapping, a, a one-to-one word mapping. So for instance, here you can see how this person is signing the word signing at this point, and here he's signing the word zip and he's signing the word I and he's signing the word language. So in total, what he has signed are all these four different languages, but what he means when he's signing those four different, for those four different words, sorry. But what he means when he's signing those four different words is actually this sentence, like sign language is truly my language. So when you leave from a video where you have to take all the context of the video and move it and translate it, this is what we call actually sign language translation, but it's different from a lot of works which are doing sign language recognition where they take, they just recognize words in the videos, but they don't actually translate the video. Yeah. So when you in recognize individual words, it's just like sign language recognition or isolated sign language recognition too. But when you take into consideration all the video and you make it into a human readable form, like sign language is truly my language, this is translation. But if you just stop here and you be like signing deep I language, you agree with me, it doesn't make much sense. But when you go translate it, it should make sense at least at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, deaf education in Africa. Uh, sign languages, you know, like uh, many African sign languages have their origin from American sign language. And American sign language has also, also its origin from old French sign language. But I want to add that it's many official African sign languages. And how did this come that we had uh, African sign language is being influenced by American sign language is because of this man, Dr. Andrew Foster. Dr. Andrew Foster was the first Black American to graduate from Gaudet University in America. And Gaudet University is, uh, one, is one of the first deaf university in the world. I mean, like completely deaf. In so if you're a deaf person, you go to Gaudet University, it's, it's a university made specifically for deaf people. So when uh, Andrew Foster graduated, he was like, he needs to come back to Africa. He wanted to come and uh, know more about how the deaf communities are coming. So he first came to Ghana, left the America, came to Ghana and he was coming just to explore how the deaf people are living here. But he realized that deaf people in Ghana were not being educated, basically. So they were having languages for them, indigenous African sign languages, but there was no education, there was no educative material for them to study in it. 
So he brought a lot of educational materials, you know, from with from American Sign Language, which were in American Sign Language content. And he shared it with them and taught also them, opened a lot of deaf schools for people, for the deaf people to leave their houses and go and uh, pursue education. And this created a mixture of the languages, the sign languages which people in Africa, in various communities, they were speaking with or they were signing with each other in, and the American Sign Language, which is what they were being taught in school. So we saw how American Sign Language started spreading all across Africa because he didn't stop in Ghana. From Ghana, he went to Nigeria and he went to the east of Africa. So he was moving from country to country, so it'd be like evangelization. And then, and due to that, that's why a lot of African sign languages have something in common in American sign language because up to a certain extent, when the children, they were going to school and being taught in American sign language and coming back home and doing their local sign language, with time, a mixture of it inserting itself. So, as I was saying, those languages, for example, Ghanaian Sign Language, Nigerian Sign Language, they are just official sign languages. But we also have to acknowledge that they were indigenous sign languages. They were sign languages that these people in Africa, they were speaking with, and they had nothing to do with American Sign Language or any foreign sign language. So there was, for example, in the Eastern region of, Niger of, of Ghana, there was the Adamorobe Sign Language, and in the Central region of Ghana, there was an Anabin sign language. And in Biu, Nigeria, there was a Bura sign language. Uh, Dr. Asunye Emanuel, who is an expert of African sign languages, has been advocating for these languages to be recognized and has been calling it as the genocide of African sign languages, of African indigenous sign languages. He has been ad advocating for the documentation of these languages for online course of African signing and rewarding participants uh, by the Nigerian Institute of Languages and developing also apps for people to learn indigenous uh, African sign languages. So I wanted to highlight the work of Dr. Asunye, uh, which I think is very remarkable as well. But in this work we did, we only focused on the country's official sign language, which is the languages which are generally being acknowledged by most of the deaf people in the country. So, but there is an effort to revive the indigenous sign languages. So even looking even at our official uh, sign languages per country, and looking at the task of sign language translation or in fact, sign languages in general, there has been very few data sets on African sign languages. Um, these, are this, these are the most prominent data sets. We have phonics from Germany, we have um, the Kitty data set from Korea, we have CSL daily data set from China, we have the Bob SL from uh, Brit Britain. Uh, how to sign from America and open ESL from America. But there was no uh, sign language for any African countries. And that was quite a bit shocking. So when we started the research, we were like, OK, we first want to create the data set. At first, we were working on um, Ghanaian sign language, maybe because I was in Ghana and stuff like that. But at, at, at the same time, we realized that many of these languages sort of had the same origin. So we were like, okay, since they have the same origin, it's going to be interesting for us to study also other African languages, such as Nigeria, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Kenya, and Zambia. So we formed a database of six um, sign languages from Bible verses, and uh, those languages were having 152 hours in total, and the vocabulary of 20,000 words. Here we refer to like the the words which are being signed, they were like 20,000. And when you look at this data set compared to other data set, it's quite a bit competitive. Uh, given that uh, foreign data set, which is like the benchmark data set in, um, in sign language translation is just 11 hours. Uh, but yeah, you had, you had up to 152 hours. We aligned the videos and uh, we looked forward to translation. So, the next step was to um, divide the videos into train dev and test sets. So 
we did that, we reported the duration of each set, the vocabulary, the number of words, the number of out of vocabulary words, the number of single terms, and the average duration of videos. The single term refers to the number of words which appear only once in the training set. We built an architecture moving forward. We were like, okay, we have the videos here, and we have the target, which is here. This is the video, this is the target. And uh, so this was sort of like the source and the target. So how are we going to extract features from the videos, meaningful information from the videos? We use Human Key Points Extractor, precisely Media Pipe Library, and extract uh, key points of the body, the hands, and the face. We normalized these key points. I aggregated the position of the key points so that they should be like one long vectors. And I should also precise that this was done frame by frame. So for instance, a video of 30 seconds of uh, 25 frames per second. So every second you have to extract uh, one frame. And for each frame, we pass it through uh, a human key point extractor, which uh, extracts all the key points in the in the frame, and then uh, that's it. Yeah, so this one corresponds to each frame. And then we pass it through a normal encoder decoder architecture. And uh, so that we expect to have a natural language, which is a spoken language here, yeah, which corresponds to where is Ghana located, for instance. We use here yeah, uh, the WLTE layers, which is a work uh, which has been done by a researcher called Vosco 2021, um, local winning text awarding. And uh, this is just to replace the real layers because uh, this type of layers were discovered to uh, reduce the model size by up to 70%, which is um, quite efficient because we have to deploy these models at the end of the day into real time or into uh, devices which people can use efficiently. The model types. Uh, we, we worked on four different sets of architectures at the end of the day. We worked on a bilingual baseline. The bilingual baseline was like we just took each language of the six languages we took each language and we trained a separate machine learning model for them, a machine translation model for them. So we can see that. So here we resulted in six different models that were trained separately. So Ghanaian Sign Language, we trained it separately, uh, Nigerian Sign Language separately, uh, Zambian Sign Language separately, uh, Zimbabwean Sign Language separately, and South African Sign Language separately. And we added to the American Sign Language. This was motivated by the insights I highlighted up, uh, uh, before, that these languages had an origin from American Sign Language. So we were like, okay, it's going to be interested to, to have American Sign Language. And also because American Sign Language data is also much more common. If I go, for instance, here, you can see how uh, we have like, 27,500 training samples for American Sign Language, ASL. And for the other sign languages, we barely have like 10,000. We have 8,500, 7,200. It's just like in spoken languages, it's much more common for you to find English text than uh, text in another language. Yeah, so it's the same thing in sign language. It's much more common for you to see uh, American Sign Language content than seeing content in another sign language. So uh, you were like, okay, let's also take it so that we can learn from um, the, the amount of the quantity of data that is in American Sign Language. So we performed these experiments. So at the end of the day, we resulted with seven baseline, that is the six African sign languages plus the American sign language, which was just uh, created. And uh, then uh, the, the next thing was to do an experiment a zero shot setting on the ASL uh, because the ASL has, because the African sign languages we study had uh, some influence from 
ASL, American Sign Language. We wanted to see how will the model perform if it's just being zero shorted on ASL model. That is, we took the test samples of each of the African Sign Languages and we just evaluated it on the ASL model trained. The next thing is that we fine tune the ASL baseline for each African Sign Language that is, We start from the ASL model and we fine tune it with the training data of every uh, African Sign Language and then we test it with the test data of every African Sign Language. And we also did the multilingual training, which uh, specifically involves like fine tuning the ASL model, but with all the African sign languages together. We train them one model, which uh, is fine tuned, which, which fine tunes the ASL model with the training data of all the six African sign languages now. And we test two. the results. Um, one thing we can say is that the the models resulting from fine tuning, whether it is from separately fine tuning or the multilingual fine tuning, sort of had <coughs> the best scores. And um, the scores were in a very low region, which highlights how hard the sign language task it is, and which is also uh, in which also matches with the type of scores that were obtained last year at the first WMT. Um, sign language translation shared task. And um, for instance, like uh, data sets, like benchmark data sets, like the 4 index 2014 data sets, usually produce very high score, blue score, like 20 and stuff. But uh, studies has been shown that those that data set, that is a 4 index 2014 data set, is very small, just 11 hours compared to a very big data set. So, uh, this sort of um, overfitting. And secondly, to uh, training about translating about weather, because the 2000, the Phoenix, the RWTH for 2014 T data set, is data set which is about, on the weather domain. So it's just about weather translation. And translating about the weather is not as hard as translating about, you know, the Bible in our, in our case. Yeah. So, the limitations of our work is that the limitations of our work is that um, we did random splitting, which cross contamination may have occurred. The um, domain we used in this study is, is 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 the Bible, and so we look forward into more um, uh, more daily use domains. And uh, the sign language visual recognition method uses pose estimation. And recent studies have shown that 3D extracting using 3D, um, pretend 3D models, which we fine tune on a bit of sign language data, uh, tends to perform better than uh, taking pose estimation methods. The takeaway is that uh, more sign language, we need more sign language research in the sign language processing research community, especially like um, we need more African also sign languages in the sign language processing research community, because up to now, we just have been saying research on American sign language, German sign language, and we don't, we might reach a point where we might see back the episodes of um, maybe low resource matching translation we are facing right now for spoken languages being reproduced also for sign languages where more and more some languages keep being studied and some languages don't keep being studied and there's a gap that keeps being inserted. Yeah. Inspiring ourselves from low resource machine translation was key. Uh, whether it is multi multilingual training, fine tuning, zero shots, those were all ideas we took from low resource machine translation. Include the people in your research. We can't say this more than enough uh, because for instance, like the insight we got about how uh, sign language were originated was made by a deaf person, Marco Nyaku, gave us that insight. And is that insight? that led us to be like, okay, let's look at maybe other African sign language, like Nigerian sign language and um, Kenyan sign language and things like that. 
So the insights you always get by working with deaf people, people of the technology you want to build in general, it's always very valuable. So yeah. And we need also extensive documentations of sign language um, to know where are these languages coming from, their phonological structure, morphology, and things like that. How to contribute? Uh, presently, we have like an effort to collect more data about African sign languages, whether it is the official sign languages or the indigenous sign languages. Mm -hmm. We need um, to put hands together to collect more data about these languages. Uh, There's an ongoing project about family adapters applied to sign language, sign languages in general. And you can also join uh, the Masakani team for the WMC Sign Language Translation uh, Share Task 2023. These are all three ongoing projects. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me your time. Um, uh, I've added the QR code for the paper, the code on GitHub and the slides in case you want to say it back. Okay, thank you so much, Chester. We're very honored to have you give us this wonderful talk on sign languages and, and African sign languages and translation. Looking forward to wonderful things that you have ahead doing. I am very sure that you will do more great things with sign languages. And just out of curiosity, do you plan to, okay, you before the talk, you mentioned multilingual. So I, I'm trying to understand that you planning to look at other fields of machine learning, uh, maybe NLP, uh, besides sign language in the future. Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, I, I actually like I am passionate about sign language because um, initially my goal is to understand intelligence, intelligence, how does the brain work and everything. So I just I just feel like this task. It's a challenging one because I'm interested in see how computer vision model, are they really just overfitting or they are really intelligent? Or do they really understand? Because a human being can learn sign language in uh, maybe let's say one month, two months, three months, but these algorithms, because maybe they have been overfitting on tasks and we think they are intelligent, they are not. So I just interested in this because it brings out a different modality in the whole space and a different task, which a uh, different challenge also for these models, how good are they going to work on? But I think my general interest is to work on what is machine intelligence? How are machine really intelligent? Are they really intelligent? And um, working at the intersection of computer vision and NLP, because I feel like at the end of the day, intelligence is brought from what you see and from what you can also communicate those two parts. So yeah, that's my general uh, um, research area and anything I feel like that falls in that range, I'm looking forward to it, yeah. I see, all right. Thank you so much, Chester. Very um, excited and honored for your presentation. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next Africa Talks. Yeah, all right, thanks.